I think it's useful to set up as a framework for discussion four uh, somewhat idealized positions with regard to the role of the state in an advanced industrial society. Uh, I want to call these positions first classical liberal, second libertarian socialist, third state socialist, four state capitalist, and I want to consider each in turn. Uh, also, I'd like to make clear my own point of view in advance so you can evaluate and judge what I'm saying. I think that the libertarian socialist concepts, and by that I mean a range of thinking that extends from left-wing Marxism through anarchism, I think that these are fundamentally correct and that they are the proper and natural extension of classical liberalism into the era of advanced industrial society. In contrast, it seems to me that the ideology of state socialism, that is what has become of Bolshevism, and of state capitalism, the modern welfare state, uh, these of course are dominant in uh, the industrial countries and the industrial societies, but I believe that they are regressive and highly inadequate social theories and that w and a, a large number of our really fundamental problems stem from a kind of incompatibility and uh, inappropriateness of these social forms to a modern industrial society. Well, then let me consider these uh, four points of reference uh, in sequence, beginning with the classical liberal point of view. Classical liberalism asserts as its major idea an opposition to all but the most restricted, minimal forms of state intervention in personal or social life. Well, this conclusion is quite familiar. However, the reasoning that leads to it is less familiar and I think a good deal more important than the conclusion itself. One of the earliest and most brilliant expositions of this position is in uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt's Limits of State Action, which was written in 1792, uh, though not published for 60 or 70 years after that. In his view, the state tends to, uh, quote, tends to make an instrument, t to make man an instrument to serve its arbitrary ends, overlooking his individual purposes. And since man is in his essence a free, searching, self-perfecting being, it follows that the state is a profoundly anti-human institution. That is, its actions, its existence, are ultimately incompatible with the full harmonious development of human potential in its richest diversity, hence incompatible with what Humboldt and in the following century Marx, Bakunin, Mill, and many others, what they see as the true end of man. And for the record, I think that this is an accurate description. The modern conservative tends to regard himself as the lineal descendant of the classical liberal in this sense, but I think that that can be maintained only from an extremely superficial point of view, as one can see by studying more carefully the fundamental ideas of classical libertarian thought, as expressed, in my opinion, in its most profound form by, by, by Humboldt. I think the issues are of really quite considerable contemporary significance, and if you don't mind a, what may appear to be a somewhat antiquarian excursion, I'd like to expand on them. Uh, for Humboldt, as for Rousseau, and before him the Cartesians, man's essential attribute is his freedom. For Humboldt, man, man is born to inquire and create. And when a man or a child chooses to inquire or create out of his own free choice, then he becomes in his own terms an artist rather than a tool of production or a well-trained parrot. And I think it's very revealing and interesting to compare it with Marx, uh, with his early, with the early Marx uh, manuscripts, in particular his account of, to quote, the alienation of labor when work is external to the worker, not part of his nature, so that he does not fulfill himself in his work, but denies himself and is physically exhausted and mentally debased. This alienated labor that casts some of the workers back into a barbarous kind of work and turns others into machines, thus depriving man of his species character, of free conscious activity and productive life. Uh, Robert Tucker, for one, has rightly emphasized that Marx sees the revolutionary more as a frustrated producer than as a dissatisfied consumer. And this far more radical critique of capitalist relations of production flows directly, often in the same words, from the libertarian thought of the Enlightenment. For this reason, I think, one must say that classical liberal ideas, in their essence, though not in the way they developed, are profoundly anti-capitalist. The essence of these ideas must be destroyed for them to serve as an ideology of modern industrial capitalism. Writing in the 1780s and early 1790s, Humboldt had no conception of the forms that industrial capitalism would take. 
Consequently, in this classic of classical liberalism, he stresses the problem of limiting state power, and he's not overly concerned with the dangers of private power. The reason is that he believes in and speaks of the essential equality of condition of private citizens. And of course, he has no idea, writing in 1790, of the ideas and of the ways in which the notion private person would come to be reinterpreted in the era of corporate capitalism. And if there is something degrading to human nature in the idea of bondage, as every spokesman for the Enlightenment would insist, then it would follow that a new emancipation must be awaited, what Fourier referred to as the third and last emancipatory phase of history, the first having made serfs out of slaves, the second wage earners out of serfs, and the third which will transform the proletariat to free men by eliminating the commodity character of labor, ending wage slavery, and bringing the commercial, industrial, and financial institutions under democratic control. These are all things that Humboldt in his classical liberal doctrine did not express and didn't see, but I think he might have accepted these conclusions. He does, for example, inter agree that state intervention in social life is legitimate if freedom would destroy the very conditions without which not only freedom but even existence itself would be inconceivable, which are precisely the circumstances that arise in an unconstrained capitalist economy. In any event, his criticism of bureaucracy and the autocratic state stands as a very eloquent forewarning of some of the most dismal aspects of modern history. And the important point is that the basis of his critique is applicable to a far broader range of coercive institutions than he imagined, in particular, to the institutions of industrial capitalism. Though he expresses a classical liberal doctrine, Humboldt is no primitive individualist in the style of, uh, for example, Rousseau. So Rousseau extols the savage who lives within himself, but Humboldt's vision is entirely different. He sums up his remarks as follows. He says, the whole tenor of the ideas and arguments unfolded in this essay might fairly be reduced to this, that while they would break all fetters in human society, they would attempt to find as many new social bonds as possible. The isolated man is no more able to develop than the one who is fettered. And he, in fact, looks forward to a community of free association without coercion by the state or other authoritarian institutions in which free men can create and inquire achieve the highest development of their powers. In fact, far ahead of his time, he presents an anarchist vision that is appropriate, perhaps, to the next stage of industrial society. We can perhaps look forward to a day when these various strands will be brought together within the framework of libertarian socialism, a social form that barely exists today, though its elements can perhaps be perceived. For example, in the guarantee of individual rights that has achieved so far its fullest realization though still tragically flawed in the Western democracies, or in the Israeli Kibbutzim, or in the experiments with workers' councils in Yugoslavia. So let me summarize this first point. The first concept of the state that I want to set up as a point of reference, classical liberal, its doctrine is that the state functions should be drastically limited, but this familiar characterization is a very superficial one. More deeply, the classical liberal view develops from a certain concept of human nature, one that stresses the importance of diversity and free creation. And therefore, this view is in fundamental opposition to industrial capitalism, with its wage slavery, its alienated labor, and its hierarchic and authoritarian principles of social and economic organization. At least in its Humboldtian form, classical liberal thought is opposed as well to the concepts of possessive individualism, which are intrinsic to capitalist ideology. So it seeks to eliminate social fetters but to replace them by social bonds, not by competitive greed, not by predatory individualism, not, of course, by corporate empire, state or private. Classical libertarian thought seems to me, therefore, to lead directly to libertarian socialism or anarchism, if you like, when combined with an understanding of industrial capitalism. Well, the second point of reference that I want to discuss is the libertarian socialist vision of the state. Uh, a French writer, rather sympathetic to anarchism, once wrote that anarchism has a broad back. Like paper, it endures anything. And there are many shades of anarchism, and I'm concerned here only with one, namely the anarchism of Bakunin, who wrote in his Anarchist Manifesto of 1865 that to be an anarchist, one must first be a socialist. I'm concerned with the anarchism of Adolf Fischer, one of the martyrs of the Haymarket Affair in 1886, who said that every anarchist is a socialist, but not every socialist is necessarily an anarchist. 
A consistent anarchist must oppose private ownership of the means of production. Such property is indeed, as Proudhon in his famous remark asserted, a form of theft. But a consistent anarchist will also oppose the organization of production by government. I'm quoting, it means state socialism, the command of the state officials over production and the command of managers, scientists, shop officials in the shop. The goal of the working class is liberation from exploitation. And this goal is not reached and cannot be reached by a new directing and governing class substituting itself for the bourgeoisie. It is only realized by the workers themselves being master over production by some form of workers' councils. These remarks, it happens, are quoted from the left-wing Marxist Anton Panikuk, and in fact, radical Marxism, what Lenin once called infantile ultra-leftism, merges with anarchist currents. The revolutionary socialist denies that state ownership can end in anything other than a bureaucratic despotism. We have seen why the state cannot democratically control industry. Industry can only be democratically owned and controlled by the workers electing directly from their own ranks, industrial administrative committees. Socialism will be fundamentally an industrial system. Its constituencies will be of an industrial character. Thus, those carrying on the social activity and industries of society will be directly represented in the local and central councils of social administration. In this way, the powers of such delegates will flow upwards from those carrying on the work and conversant with the needs of the community. When the Central Administrative Industrial Committee meets, it will represent every phase of social activity. Hence, the capitalist political or geographical state will be replaced by the Industrial Administrative Committee of Socialism. The transition from one social system to the other will be the social revolution. The political state throughout history has meant the government of men by ruling classes. The Republic of Socialism will be the government of industry administered on behalf of the whole community. The former meant the economic and political subjection of the many. The latter will mean the economic freedom of all. It will be, therefore, a true democracy. One might argue, at least I would argue, that council communism in this sense is the natural form of revolutionary socialism in an industrial society. It reflects the intuitive understanding that democracy is largely a sham when the industrial system is controlled by any form of autocratic elite, whether of owners, managers, technocrats, a vanguard party, a state bureaucracy, or whatever. Under these conditions of authoritarian domination, the classical liberal ideals, which are expressed also by Marx and Bakunin and all true revolutionaries, cannot be realized. Man will, in other words, not be free to inquire and create, to develop his own potentialities to their fullest. The worker will remain a fragment of a human being, degraded, a tool in the productive process directed from above. Now, the ideas of revolutionary libertarian socialism in this sense, they've been submerged in the industrial societies of the past half century. The dominant ideologies have been those of state socialism and state capitalism. Now, it may seem quixotic to group left Marxism and anarchism under the same rubric as I've done, given the antagonism throughout the past century between Marxists and anarchists, beginning with the antagonism between Marx and Engels on the one hand, and, for example, Proudhon and Bakunin on the other. In the 19th century, at least, their differences with regard to the question of the state was significant, but in a sense it was tactical. The anarchists were convinced that capitalism and the state must be destroyed together. Uh, Engels, in a letter of 1883, expressed his opposition to this idea as follows. The anarchists put the thing upside down. They declare that the proletarian revolution must begin by doing away with the political organization of the state, but to destroy it at such a moment would be to destroy the only organism by means of which the victorious proletariat can assert its newly conquered power, hold down its adversaries, and carry out that economic revolution of society without which the whole victory must end in a new defeat and in a mass slaughter of the workers similar to those after the Paris Commune. Now, the Paris Commune, I think it's fair to say, did represent the ideas of libertarian socialism, of anarchism, if you like. And Marx, of course, wrote about it with great enthusiasm. Uh, he, in fact, the experience of the Commune led him to modify his concept of the role of the state, uh, as you can see, for example, by looking at the introduction to the Communist Manifesto, the, the edition of it that was published in 1872, and to take on something like a more anarchist perspective of the nature of social revolution. Well, the commune was, of course, drowned in blood, as the anarchist communes of Spain were destroyed by fascist and communist armies. And it might be argued that more dictatorial structures would have defended the revolution against such forces. But I doubt this very much. 
at least in the case of Spain, it seems to me that a more consistent libertarian policy might have provided the only possible defense of the revolution. Uh, Lenin, till the end of his life, stressed the idea, I quote, that it is an elementary truth of Marxism that the victory of socialism requires the joint effort of workers in a number of advanced countries. At the very least, it requires that the great centers of world imperialism be impeded by domestic pressures from counter-revolutionary intervention. Only such possibilities will permit any revolution to overthrow its own coercive state institutions as it, over, as it tries to bring the economy under direct democratic control. Well, let me summarize briefly again. I've mentioned so far two reference points for a discussion of the state, classical liberalism and libertarian socialism. They're in agreement that the functions of the state are repressive and that state action must be limited. The libertarian socialist goes on to insist that the state power must be eliminated in favor of the democratic organization of industrial society, with direct popular control over all institutions by those who participate in, as well as those who are directly affected by the workings of these institutions. So one might imagine then a system of workers' councils, consumers' councils, commune assemblies, regional federations, and so on, with the kind of representation that's direct and revocable, in the sense that representatives are directly answerable to and return directly to the well-defined and integrated social group for which they speak in some higher order organization, something obviously very different than our system of representation. Now, it might very well be asked whether such a social structure is feasible in a complex, highly technological society. There are counter-arguments, and I think they fall into two main categories. First category is that such an organization is contrary to human nature, and the second category says roughly that it's incompatible with the demands of efficiency, and I'd like to briefly consider each of these. Consider the first, that a free society is contrary to human nature. It's often asked, do men really want freedom? Do they want the responsibility that goes with it? Or would they prefer to be ruled by a benevolent master? Consistently, apologists for the existing distribution of power have held to one or another version of the idea of the happy slave. 200 years ago, Rousseau denounced the sophistic politicians and intellectuals who search for ways to obscure the fact, so he maintained, that the essential and defining property of man is freedom. They attribute to man a natural inclination to servitude without thinking that it is the same for freedom as for innocence and virtue. Their value is felt only as long as one enjoys them oneself, and the taste for them is lost as soon as one has lost them. As proof of this doctrine, he refers to the marvels done by all free peoples to guard themselves from oppression. True, he says, those who have abandoned the life of a free man do nothing but boast incessantly of the peace and repose they enjoy in their chains. But when I see the others sacrifice pleasures, repose, wealth, power, and life itself, for the preservation of this sole good, which is so disdained by those who have lost it, when I see multitudes of entirely naked savages scorn European voluptuousness and endure hunger, fire, the sword, and death to preserve only their independence, I feel it does not behoove slaves to reason about freedom. Rather similar thoughts were expressed by Kant 40 years later. He cannot, he says, express the propos accept the proposition that certain people are not ripe for freedom for example, the serfs of some landlord. If one accepts this assumption, he writes, freedom will never be achieved, for one cannot arrive at the maturity for freedom without having already acquired it. One must be free to learn how to make use of one's powers freely and usefully. The first attempts will surely be brutal and will lead to a state of affairs more painful and dangerous than the former condition, under the dominance but also the protection of an external authority. However, one can achieve reason only through one's own experiences and one must be free to be able to undertake them. To accept the principle that freedom is worthless for those under one's control, and that one has the right to refuse it to them forever, is an infringement on the right of God himself, who has created man to be free. This particular remark is interesting because of its context as well. Kant, on this, on this occasion, was defending the French Revolution during the terror against those who claimed that it showed the masses to be unready for the privilege of freedom. And his remarks, too, I think, have obvious contemporary relevance. No rational person will approve of violence and terror, and in particular, the terror of the post-revolutionary state, which has fallen into the hands of a grim autocracy, has more than once reached indescribable levels of savagery. At the same time, no person of understanding or humanity will too quickly condemn the violence that often occurs when long subdued masses rise against their oppressors or take their first steps towards liberty and social reconstruction.
Rosa Luxemburg's fraternal, sympathetic critique of Bolshevik ideology and practice was given in very similar terms. Only the active participation of the masses in self-government and social reconstruction could bring about what she described as the complete spiritual transformation in the masses degraded by centuries of bourgeois class rule, just as only their creative experience and spontaneous action can solve the myriad problems of creating a libertarian socialist society. What of the second question, the question of efficiency? Is democratic control of the industrial system down to its smallest functional units incompatible with efficiency? This is very frequently argued on several grounds. Some say, for example, that centralized management is a technological imperative. But I think the argument is exceedingly weak when one looks into it. The very same technology that brings relevant information to the board of managers can bring it at the time that it is needed to everyone in the workforce. The technology that's now capable of eliminating the stupefying labor that turns men into specialized tools of production, this technology permits in principle leisure and the educational opportunities that make them able to use this information in a rational way. And furthermore, even an economic elite which is dripping with soulfulness, to use Ralph Miliband's phrase, is constrained by the system in which it functions to organize production for certain ends, power, growth, profit, but not in the nature of the case, human needs, needs that to an ever more critical degree can be expressed only in collective terms. It's surely conceivable and perhaps it's even likely that decisions made by the collective itself will reflect these needs and interests as well as those made by various soulful elites. In any event, it's a bit difficult to take seriously arguments about efficiency in a society that devotes such enormous resources to waste and destruction. As everyone knows, the very concept of efficiency is dripping with ideology. Maxim maximization of commodities is hardly the only measure of a decent existence. The point is familiar and no elaboration is necessary. Well, let me turn finally to the two final points of reference, the Bolshevik or state socialist and the state capitalist. As I've tried to suggest, they have points in common. And in interesting respects, they diverge from the classical liberal ideal or its later elaboration in libertarian socialism. Since I'm concerned with our society, let me make a few rather elementary observations about the role of the state, its likely evolution, and the ideological assumptions that accompany and sometimes disguise these phenomena. It's obvious to begin with that we can distinguish two systems of power, the political system and the economic system. The former consists in principle of elected representatives of the people who set public policy. The latter, in principle, is a system of private power a system of private empires that are free from public control, except in the remote and indirect ways in which even a feudal nobility or totalitarian dictatorship must be responsive to the public will. There are several immediate consequences of this organization of society. The first is that in a subtle way, an authoritarian cast of mind is induced in a very large mass of the population, which is subject to arbitrary decree from above. Second fact, that is important is that the range of decisions that are in principle subject to public democratic control is quite narrow. For example, it excludes in law and in principle the central institutions in any advanced industrial society, that is the entire commercial, industrial, and financial system. And a third fact is that even within the narrow range of issues that are submitted in principle to democratic decision making, the centers of private power, of course, exert an inordinately heavy influence in perfectly obvious ways through control of the media, through control of political organizations, or for, in fact, for this, by the simple and direct means of supplying the top personnel for the parliamentary system itself, as they obviously do. Uh, Dick Barnett, in a recent study of this, reports his study of the top 400 decision makers in the post-war national security system that most have, I quote now, come from executive suites and law offices within shouting distance of each other in 15 city blocks and five major cities. And every other study shows the same thing. In short, the democratic system, at best, functions within a very narrow range in a capitalist democracy. And even within this narrow range, its functioning is enormously biased by the concentrations of private power and by the authoritarian and passive modes of thinking that are induced by autocratic institutions, such as industries, for example. It's a truism, but one that must be constantly stressed that capitalism and democracy are ultimately quite un incompatible. And a careful look at the matter, I think, merely strengthens this conclusion. There are perfectly obvious processes of centralization of control taking place in both the political and the industrial system. 
As far as the political system is concerned, in every parliamentary democracy, not only ours, the role of parliament in policy formation has been declining in the years since World War II, as everyone knows and political commentators repeatedly point out. The executive, in other words, has become increasingly more powerful as the planning functions of the state uh, become more significant. George Ball has explained that the project of constructing an integrated world economy dominated by American capital, an empire in other words, is no idealistic pipe dream, but a hard-headed prediction. It's a role, he says, into which we are being pushed by the imperatives of our own economy, the major instrument being the multinational corporation, which George Ball describes as follows. In its modern form, the multinational corporation, or one with worldwide operations and markets, is a distinctly American development. Through such corporations, it has become possible for the first time to use the world's resources with maximum efficiency. But there must be greater unification of the world economy to give full play to the benefits of multinational corporations. These multinational corporations are the beneficiary of the mobilization of resources by the federal government, and its worldwide operations and markets are backed ultimately by American military force, now based in dozens of countries. It's not difficult to guess who will reap the benefits from the integrated world economy, which is the domain of operation of these American-based international economic institutions. The Cold War ideology and the international communist conspiracy function in an important way as essentially a propaganda device to mobilize support at a particular historical moment for this long-time imperial enterprise. In fact, I believe that this is probably the main function of the Cold War. It serves as a useful device for the managers of American society and their counterparts in the Soviet Union to control their own populations and their own respective imperial systems. I think that the persistence of the Cold War can be in part explained by its utility for the managers of the two great world systems. It may be added that the ensuing Cold War carried further the depoliticization of American society and created a kind of a psychological environment in which the government is able to intervene, in part through fiscal policies, in part through public work and public services, but very largely, of course, through defense spending. Again, I want to emphasize the role in this system of the Cold War as a technique of domestic control, technique for developing the psychological climate of paranoia and psychosis, in which the taxpayer will be willing to provide an enormous, endless subsidy to the technologically advanced sectors of American industry and the corporations that dominate this increasingly centralized system. Well, of course, perfectly obvious that Russian imperialism is not an invention of American ideologists. It's real enough to the Hungarians or the Czechs, for example. Well, one can continue with this indefinitely. I mean to suggest that the Cold War is highly functional, both to the American elite and its Soviet counterpart, who in a perfectly similar way exploit Western imperialism, which they did not invent, as they send their armies into Czechoslovakia. It's important in both cases in providing an ideology for empire, and for the government subsidized system here of military capitalism. It's predictable then that challenges to this ideology will be bitterly resisted by force if necessary. Now in many ways American society is indeed open and liberal values are preserved. However, as poor people and black people and other ethnic minorities know very well, the liberal veneer is pretty thin. Mark Twain once wrote, that it is by the goodness of God that in our country we have those three unspeakably precious things, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, and the prudence never to practice either of them. <laughs> those who lack the prudence may well pay the cost. Roughly speaking, I think it's accurate to say that a corporate elite of managers and owners governs the economy and the political system as well uh, the political system as well, at least in very large measure. The people, so-called, do exercise an occasional choice among those who Marx once called the rival factions and adventurers of the ruling class. And those who find this characterization too harsh may prefer the formulations of a modern democratic theorist like Joseph Schumpeter, who describes modern political democracy favorably as a system in which the deciding of issues by the electorate is secondary to the election of the men who are to do the deciding. A political party, he says, accurately, is a group whose members propose to act in concert in the competitive struggle for political power. If that were not so, it would be impossible for different parties to adopt exactly or almost exactly the same program. This program that both parties adopt, more or less exactly, and the individuals who compete for power, they express a narrow conservative ideology 
basically the interests of one or other element in the corporate elite, with some modifications. Now, this is obviously no conspiracy. I think it's simply implicit in the system of corporate capitalism. These people and the institutions they represent are, in effect, in power, and their interests are the national interest. It's this interest that is served primarily and overwhelmingly by the overseas empire and the growing system of military state capitalism at home. If we were to withdraw the consent of the governed, as I think we should, we're withdrawing our consent to have these men and the interests they represent govern and manage American society and impose their concept of world order and their criteria for legitimate political and economic development in much of the world. Although an immense effort of propaganda and mystification is carried on to conceal these facts, nonetheless facts they remain. We have today the technical and material resources to meet man's animal needs. We have not developed the cultural and moral resources or the democratic forms of social organization that make possible the humane and rational use of our material wealth and power. Conceivably, the classical liberal ideals, as expressed and developed in their libertarian socialist form, are achievable. But if so, only by a popular revolutionary movement rooted in wide strata of the population and committed to the elimination of repressive and authoritarian institutions, state and private. To create such a movement is the challenge we face and must meet if there's to be an escape from contemporary barbarism. Thank you.